Maybe he has stronger thumbs. Yeah. He definitely <laughs> has stronger thumbs. <laughs> Look at thumb wrestle. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I think of Intense, I think of fast bikes and bright colors, which pretty much describes their brand new Tracer 279, one of three mixed wheel bikes we've got at our Enduro Bike Field Test in Bellingham, Washington. The new Tracer has 170 millimeters of rear wheel travel via a counter-rotating dual link layout that Intense calls JS Tuned Suspension. They fit it with a coil sprung Olin's shock that sits super low in the frame, and there's a 170 millimeter travel Olin's fork up front to match. Other details include tons of room for a bottle inside the front triangle, titanium pivot hardware, and there's a hidden storage compartment on the underside of the down tube that you might not spot or be able to use unless you flip the bike upside down. Our Tracer 279 test bike is the S model that gets you Olin suspension, a set of powerful Megura MT7 brakes, an NX drivetrain, and a price tag of $7,200 American. Let's find out how the new Tracer performed on the trails. We've talked about all the details of this new bike. It's time to talk about how it rides. We're gonna start with climbing and we know that these things they're not built to be amazing climbers, but let's talk about it relative to the other enduro bikes, Kaz. What did you make of the Intense's pedaling? Yeah, the Intense has a lot of energy. So even with the coil- Energy. It does have energy, okay. yes. Yeah, I'm gonna use that word. Yeah. Um, it's got a coil shock, and a lot of times you think that's gonna be that stuck to the ground, kind of more lethargic. Yeah. But with this bike, it sits fairly high in its travel when you're pedaling. Um, it doesn't really have a climb switch. You could adjust the compression if you wanted, but I didn't even really do that. So it just kind of feels like that has more get up and go than some of the other bikes. That Olin shock doesn't have a, an assist switch or anything like it? It does, like a compression switch, but there's no lockout. It's a yeah. coil shock. Also. Yeah, so, okay, fair um, enough. So yeah, it does feel like it, it does pedal pretty well. I think it's got a pretty high anti-squat number. Yeah. Um, it's got that dual link design. So those tend to kind of have that little bit firmer ped pedaling platform. Mm -hmm. I think that pairs well with the coil shock. All right, Matt, what happens when you get this tracer on a tricky climb? Some single track, it's muddy, it's rooty, you're going half a mile an hour, what happens? So Kaz alluded to that with um, the coil shock. It is quite active, but just in the beginning part of the travel. Mm -hmm. So when you're climbing, it doesn't sink too far down. It does track really well and it's quite short. So it, it is a little bit easier to navigate through some of the switchbacks than the other bikes. What about you, Kaz? What did you think of this bike when it was tricky and tight? Yeah, it does pretty well. Um, the geometry on this bike is a little towards the conservative side. I mean, we can't really call it 64 degrees conservative, but that's in the low setting. So it has a higher setting that's 64.5 degrees, which I would say on this bike, again, we'll get into this more when we talk about descending. I don't know how many riders are gonna use that high setting because it is a 170 mil travel bike designed for indoor racing, that type of stuff. So either way though, um, it does have a pretty, it's a little bit quicker handling than some of the other bikes. A lot of the other bikes are a little bit longer and just a yeah. little bit more of a handful where this one kind of has a little, little snappier handling. So somebody that is riding in a little slower speed, tighter trails, they might get along with this one better than a couple of the other more longer, kind of more single-mindedly downhill focused bikes that we have on test. Yeah, I was curious about that, especially compared to the Common Saw. Like that Common Saw, it's a huge rear end on it. Mm -hmm. it. I mean, they're both long slack bikes, you know? Yeah. But in that tight stuff, there is a noticeable difference between a bike like the Meta SX and the Intense, I would imagine, right? Totally. And on my first ride on the Intense, I, we were riding a very technical tight trail, kind of yeah. slow, wet routes you had to pump through. And I thought this would be a really good enduro race bike for that tighter stuff. It was had a lot of traction at the beginning of the stroke and then ramped up really quick, especially in the low setting. So it, it definitely carried a lot of speed and had a lot of energy, but on the bigger compressions is where we started to get into some more trouble, had a lot of progression, built up a lot of energy and was kind of harder to hold on to. Kaz, I noticed that this bike also came with a 30 tooth chain ring. How does that work out on the trail, especially with that smaller rear wheel? Yeah, I mean, if you have super, super steep climbs, you might like that, but I feel like on a bike like this, it's kind of geared towards being even more of a race bike. Some riders may find themselves running out of top end uh, speed. I mean, 30 is pretty small, especially with a smaller rear wheel. You know, you see 29ers, full 29ers with a uh, 30 tooth chain ring, but I think a 32, probably a little more appropriate mm -hmm. spec, but Depends where you're riding. Me, I, I could be, definitely get a, away with a 32 and be fine. Um, so it might be something some riders may swap out. Other ones, be perfectly happy with their really easy gear. Just 
grinding up the hills. And one final point on the climbing, we talked about that common saw versus this one. Yeah. They're almost the same weight. The ones in oh, aluminum. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. The common saw is aluminum mm -hmm. and it retails for 58, 58 I think. Mm -hmm. That tracer is quite a bit more expensive. It's carbon fiber. Yeah. You're telling me they basically weigh the same? Yeah, pretty much within like four ounces. Wow. So a quarter pound. So when you guys were talking about the common saw, I mean, that's a big, heavy, long bike. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we just talked about that intense. It's carbon fiber, but it, it basically weighs the same. But on the trail, I mean, one has an air shock, one has a coil sprung shock. On the trail, do they feel like they weigh the same? Is there the same energy there? Yeah, I'd say that the Intense carries its weight a little better. Yeah. Like, there's no getting around the fact that this isn't the lightest carbon frame out there. You know, there's carbon can be used to just for lightweight. Other times, carbon is the best way just to achieve a certain that's a, frame that's shape. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. The, the carbon here isn't maybe not just for lightweight. I mean, this is an enduro bike. Right. right? Um, but as far as how they feel on the trail, being similar weights, I would say that this definitely feels like an easier bike to climb. I think some of that goes down to the geometry of the common saw versus this bike. Again, we had control tires, so those are all the same, yeah. but the intense just a little bit easier to handle. Let's move on to descending. And I want to start with that Olin's shock on the back of this bike and the dual link design. Tell me what you make of that. What did that feel like on the trail? Yeah, so right out of the gate, I tried it in the high setting. And although I was getting the right sag, it just didn't sit low enough for me. Mm -hmm. So I went to the low setting to get the bike to sit a little more aggressive, a little slacker, still with the right sag, but it never felt like it was getting full travel. It kind of felt like a shorter 155, 160 bike to me. Really? Never got any big bottom outs or harsh compressions, but it would ramp really quick. And what, I felt- What's the downside to that on the trail, Matt? Like, what does that feel like on the trail when you're not getting enough travel in a certain spot? So over like small stutter bumps, it feels really good because yeah. the shock is really active and it's moving fast at the beginning of the travel. It does kind of make it unsettled at times when you're braking. And then in the bigger compressions, it, it's kind of hard to predict where the bike is going to be in the travel. It doesn't feel consistent. It's kind of like okay. jumping on a trampoline. You know, you can get double bounce sometimes and it just yeah. holds a lot of energy and it's not as easy to interpret how the bike's going to react to that. Okay, Kaz? Yeah, I, on this bike, when I was riding it, I didn't really look at all the specs super close, just kind of showed up like, sweet, we'll start riding it. And I would have thought it was a 160 bike, like 160 mils of rear travel. Just, that doesn't sound like a compliment. Well, I think it's okay in some in some aspects. Like it does have a very progressive, like a lot of ramp up in the end of the stroke in that lower setting. And mm -hmm. I kind of like that. For me, it felt like the bike was kind of propelling me down the trail. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a lot of energy and it's pushing you. So in the right, when it's working, it can feel good. It can feel like you're just accelerating. We did some shuttle laps and I felt like, on that day, I was going, like, I felt like I was going quick. Like, oh, yeah. this bike is just letting me go really fast. But that bike, that trail was a little bit higher speed and not as many, like, super big hits. But like Matt was saying, when you do get those bigger hits, it can kind of be like, oh, I got to hang on and brace for this. So it's not that stuck, glued to the ground, let you get away with anything. You kind of have to be a little bit more alert and just ready to respond to how, to what it's doing. It sounds like there's one or two things with the suspension that, I mean, maybe stood out to you guys. But let's move on to the handling now, Kaz. Uh, tell me how this bike felt when it was really fast and rough. Let's pretend just for a minute that you're at an enduro race on this thing and it's fast and rough. How does it handle? It feels good for that. Like this is the bike out of all of them, I think for me that felt the closest to a race bike. Like it makes you want to go fast. Um, it responds quick, whether the terrain is wide open and super fast or a little bit tighter and you need to wiggle around some stuff. So I think it has that really good race bike feel, but that does is a little bit less of uh, less margin for error, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So when on yeah. edge. Yeah. On edge. When you're on your A game, it's good, but if you're a little bit off or if you're just not paying attention, it can feel a little different. Like, I know Matt was thinking he wanted it to be slacker. It feels steeper than it is. Like, I got my little angle finder and measured just to make sure that the geometry chart wasn't lying because sometimes the numbers are a little fudged. But this one, it was bang on. It was 64 degrees, but it feels a little steeper, right? Like, you were definitely, you noticed it a little more yeah. than me, but I'd say that something's making it have that. Yeah, I think it was more so for me, like going into corners, breaking into something really rough. The bike was just kind of lurching back and forth a lot. There was a lot of like, so you look at the numbers on paper, like we talked about, and it says 64 dynamic geo and you get on the bike and it sags. It feels moderately slack, not as crazy as something like the commensal, but I think it's more so when you're braking, there's a lot of weight shift. So I did have to like, like kind of crank in the low speed compression on both the fork and the shock just to kind of calm it down a little bit. And that helped. A little bit, yeah. But yeah. then it started to get a little bit too rough, so I kind of had to dial that out a little bit and okay. played back and forth there quite a bit. So I'm going to try to turn this into a positive here. 
is that a is that an advantage when it's not fast and rough Kaz? when the trail is slow and pokey is this does that help this bike i think it can be like i think for me i actually i think i like this bike more than that which that's how things go you know everyone has their own little preference and i kind of like yeah. the way this bike it just had that kind of like sporty feel to it you're almost trying to figure it out but it's not the easiest bike to ride okay. um, and that you kind of have to pay attention which i think for me was making me pay attention which is probably making me kind of go a little faster and be more focused. Yeah. But then on those days where you're a little off, it's like uh, it could, a little room for error might be nice too, so. Yeah, I wouldn't say I totally disliked it. It just had a lot of energy and yeah, you kind of had to be on your game. All right, that is how the new Tracer descends. Let's move on to component highs and lows. Guys, tell me what you like. Yeah, I really like that Olin's 38 fork. I haven't spent a ton of time on that just because it's not quite as commonly spec'd on the bikes that we've been seeing for testing, but I was able to get it set up pretty quickly, even though it's a little more involved. You've got two air chambers, so one adjusts the kind of end stroke ramp up and the other adjusts the initial portion of the travel, but I found a sweet spot. Um, could use full travel when necessary, but it's nice and smooth, plenty stiff, so big fan of that. Magura brakes. I wasn't as big a fan because of pad rub, but I do like the feel. I know Man, that's the a pad rub's fan. annoying. I know, it's really annoying. The pad rub is annoying. It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. something I'm willing to put up with because I just feel they have a lot of power. They're well modulated and they're instant. Like they just start to break as soon as you touch the levers. Mm -hmm. And that's something I don't quite get or feel as much with the other brakes on the market. Because the pads are like this close. Yeah, that's because they're <laughs> literally <laughs> touching the rotor already. <laughs> Anyways, this thing also has an E13 dropper post on it. What did you make of that? The dropper post had some, yeah, really light action. Uh, the lever was covered in grip tape, which was pretty neat. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the matchmakers that we talked about before, if they're not SRAM specific or brand matching, then they don't always line up perfectly. Yeah. So it was a little bit harder to reach the, the railer shifter. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on and talk about the stuff that these guys had some troubles with. And in the intro, I talked a lot about how it was cool that this thing is all held together with titanium hardware. I mean, that is neat. But Cass, let's tell, tell me about hardware. Yeah, some of the hardware definitely came loose while okay. we were riding multiple times. Um, you know, again, with new bikes, there is a little bit of a break-in period, so things can come loose, but the main pivot, kind of like the, actually the lowest pivot on the bike, um, is an expanding collet system, which is pretty nice, but that came loose, and so we had to tighten that up. But even the whole, so basically the way it works, there's a bolt into the, the wedge the wedge that goes in the collet and then that whole part started rotating. So you kind of need, now to tighten it, you're gonna have to do something tricky to extract that. Um, that explanation might seem complicated, but basically we had some pivot hardware coming loose. The so one final component note, I can talk about the Chad box. So that's their in-frame storage system. This one is actually on the bottom of the down tube, which- Wait, 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 wait. So when you have to flip, do you flip your bike upside down to get access to it? You would have to, yeah. Does the stuff fall out or does it like stay in the hatch lid? or something. Uh, you can attach some stuff to the hatch lid and the rest of the stuff would just be slid into the down tube. Okay. Um, so kind of like, like on an e-bike where the battery would go basically. Yeah. But it does have that bag. It comes with yeah. a neoprene bag like we've seen with Specialized and Santa yep. Cruz. And yeah. But so the flipping the bike upside down is kind of an issue. Like if you're on a super muddy ride, it is kind of annoying to need to flip your bike to access anything in there. And I imagine like it, the, the hatch is going to be covered with mud and all this stuff yeah, anyway. Exactly. Yeah. And then the other trouble is getting it, actually getting it open is pretty inconvenient. It's hard. Like. One time it was so stuck that I had to use a tire lever, which in, normally would be inside your chat box, so I don't know how I'd open it, but I'd use a tire lever to pry the little latch to open it up. Um, it's just not as refined as what like Specialized or Trek are using, or uh, the Santa Cruz Mega Tower that we've got, for example. So Can you can you just imagine getting a flat out on the trail, and you have a pump, you have a tube, or your plugs, or whatever, but they're stuck inside your frame, and you can't get them? Yeah. Nightmare. I'd be real frustrated. So I would be very frustrated. It's nice to have in-frame storage. I'm a fan of that. But this execution, I mean, you know, it's they've got the room in there, so maybe they'll just make the box, the, the lid of the box, a little better in future versions. But for for now, it's kind of hard to open. Kind of pain. Moving on to timed laps, Matt. How did it do? The tracer was kind of mid-pack. Uh, it was fourth out of seven, and it felt really good on the trail. It, like I mentioned before earlier, it is really active at the beginning of the travel. So over roots and rocks, small stutter bumps, it has a lot of traction. Um, it was more so in the straight line, high speed stuff where I felt it was a little bit twitchier handling. And that was kind of down to the head tube angle that we talked about, maybe not being as slack feeling mm -hmm. dynamically loaded. Cass, how did it work out for you? For me, this is a sixth uh, place bike out of seven. 
it felt faster though. I was surprised by that, but you know, there's always all kinds of little asterisks next to time testing. But um, yeah, so it ended not my fastest lap mm -hmm. time was on this, but overall the general feel, I would say it felt faster than, it, than the clock said. We're gonna move on to models and pricing. There are only a few of these things. This bike is $7,200, I think. Yep. What are the other models? Um, so the next model down is the expert version and that one's $5,499. Mm -hmm. um, comes with, instead of the old one stuff, you get Fox suspension, you get code brakes, um, and you do get a SRAM NX drivetrain, which to me, that's a lot of money for an NX drivetrain. Yeah, that does sound like a lot yeah, of money for an NX Carbon drivetrain. frame, but for the values, kind of middle of the road for value. Neither one is gonna like, they're not gonna, they don't stand out as a super screaming deal, but at least the suspension is good on them. And this is now consumer direct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you kind of have two build kits, one with the premium suspension and the other at a lower price point, both with carbon frames. We're gonna talk about pros and cons before we get out of here. Matt, tell me about the pros first. I think like the general ethos of this bike is like it's compact and like has a lot of energy has a low standover height, a short chain stay, and a small rear wheel. So it kind of has that get up and go. Mm -hmm. And then other attributes of the frame, it has the tool free rear wheel skewer. So it is easy to take the rear wheel off. If you gotta fix a flat, whatever, you don't need tools. If you do need them, they are in the down tube. I thought that was pretty clever. Mm -hmm. I didn't have an issue with the, the Chad box. Um, do you think, longer. yeah, you're, maybe your fingers are a lot stronger thumbs, than Casimir's. Maybe, who knows, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kaz, I'm gonna toss the cons to you. What didn't you like? Sure. Um, I think we talked about the geometry before is having the low setting could probably be the high setting. You know, we're talking about a 170 mil bike here. I just feel like the high setting is not that usable. It'd be nice if they made it made low, even lower, and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, so that's one potential con, but if that geometry setting works for you, then it's not really con. Um, also, I couldn't get into the Chad box very easily, so that'd be con for me. And then the final one would just be that loosening pivot hardware. Mm -hmm. um, that can happen, but again, it didn't happen with a lot of the other bikes, so mm -hmm. something to note. I saw, I see another note on here, dedicated mixed wheel. Is that a con that you can't run a 29 inch rear wheel on this thing? Because that's the same for the other bikes here as well. Yeah, I think that it's almost like, like an overall con. It'd be nice yeah. if more of these bikes, you could run both wheel sizes. Cause I've seen it from other companies where it just has a little flip chip and you can just kind of open up sense. more options. Um, so that's kind of more of a con that we're seeing. It's not just an intense con, it's a con that multiple bikes have it. But it would be nice if these mixed wheel bikes just allowed you to mix and match and experiment. Cause I think that's pretty fun. Or, you know, some other brands have multiple bikes in their enduro lineup mm -hmm. and they have dual 29 or they're configurable with both rear wheels, but this is dedicated and this is intense as only enduro bike. Mm -hmm. So that's something to note. Yeah, that's definitely noteworthy. Okay, we're gonna wrap this review up by talking about who best suits this bike. Matt, who best suits this bike? <laughs> I think somebody that rides fairly tighter technical trails and likes a bike with a lot of progression but still wants that supple feel. So there's a lot of tunability with the fork, um, so you can make that equally as progressive as the rear, and that can give you a lot of traction at low speed, and I think Kaz and I both agreed that this was a really good climbing bike too. Kaz, you agree with what Matt has to say about that thing? Yeah, I think he, he hit all the key points. I mean, it just feels like a bike with a lot of energy, be a good race bike, you know, good kind of like all mountain aggressive trail bike too, just because it doesn't feel like it's as big and single-minded as some of the other ones. So. Yeah, all right, so well-rounded, you would say. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that is it for the Intense Tracer. Tell us what you think of Intense's new mixed wheel enduro bike in the comments below. And as always, subscribe so you don't miss any future review videos.